Morning, everyone. Am I coming through? Got it. Uh, well, welcome today. A uh, particularly warm welcome to you uh, if you're uh, new here or just joined us. Uh, we're actually having, uh, as a church, we usually work our way through a book of the Bible, um, but today we're doing a one-off uh, in the book of Job. I'll be away over the next two weeks on leave, and Ron and David, our elders, will be preaching from 2nd and 3rd John. Um, but if uh, you're not a Christian or new to Christianity, I'm glad you're here. Uh, you might, however, not know much about Job. Um, Job is actually one of the saddest people in the Bible. Uh, and the reason he's one of the saddest people is not just because uh, he has one of those names that he always has to explain it to people. I don't know if you're like one of those people, uh, your, your name is spelt one way but pronounced another. You can kind of imagine Job, he's on the phone, he's saying, yet yeah, J-O-B, I know it's spelt Job, but it's pronounced Job. Uh, if you're one, someone with a name like that, you know that pain. It actually gives me a good opportunity to publicly apologize to Lindell in the office. I've been pronouncing her name Lindell for too long. Uh, it's, it's pronounced Lindell. Sorry, Lindell. But uh, seriously, um, Job, the, this uh, man in the Bible, he experiences profound tragedy and suffering in his life. Uh, he loses his family, his possessions, his health, uh, and everything. And this story in the Bible is designed to teach us, to prepare us for when tragedy strikes us and those whom we love. So keep your Bible open. We're going to need it as we're going through. And so the big question that we have for today is where do you go to find wisdom? And more specifically, where do you go to find wisdom in the midst of suffering? When you get that cancer diagnosis, that loss of job, divorce, where can you go to make sense of all that? And what do you tell the people who come to you in the midst of their suffering? When they come to you for wisdom and they ask you, why is this happening to me? What have I done to deserve all this? This is a never-ending search for wisdom, wisdom in the midst of suffering. And that's exactly where we find Job in our passage today. Uh, and it's the big question throughout the book of Job. In the last 20-odd chapters of the book that we haven't read, Job and his three friends have been bombarding him with their own wisdom in these kind of poetic speeches. And their wisdom has been basically this. Job, you're suffering, so you must have done something wrong. But needless to say, uh, Job is less than impressed by this wisdom from his three friends that they've been giving him, and he's been answering them back in his own poetic speeches. And some of the speeches from Job have come from a pretty dark place. They're heavy reading. Job is in some of the deepest, darkest valleys of his life. And as you read through the book of Job, you kind of take that journey with him into these dark valleys. I, I won't lie to you, it's pretty heavy going, reading through the book of Job. But here in chapter 28, we get a little bit of a, a little bit of a break, a little bit of a rest. Here in chapter 28, it's, it's kind of a little bit of an intermission where the narrator um, of Job kind of ponders for a moment before we go into the next chapter. Uh, and you might have noticed if you read through the book of Job that there's a repeated word that comes up again and again and again. It's wisdom. Wisdom. It comes up here, there, and everywhere. If you scratch the surface of Job, underneath you'll find wisdom is the common thread that's going the whole way through. In fact, you could title the whole book of Job, Job, The Search for Wisdom in Suffering. And so with that in mind, we'll have three points today. Our first point, the endless search for wisdom from verses 1 to 22. Our second point, only God knows wisdom from verses 23 to 27. And finally, wisdom is fear God and turn away from evil in verse 28. Uh, let's begin with our first point, the endless search for wisdom. Now, uh, have a look at the, uh, the, the passage in front of you. Now, as you have a look at what we read today, it's not exactly what you'd expect in a book on suffering. Cast your eye over the passage from verses 1 to 11. What do we see here? 
well, we kind of get this brief poetic reflection on underground mining. It's a bit of a kind of artistic musing on mining, on how great humans are at finding minerals and things under the ground. I don't know about you, but that's not exactly what I expect. And uh, do we ever stop to muse on the wonders of human ingenuity? I mean, maybe next time you're down in Brisbane and you're going through the Clem 7 Tunnel or the Legacy Tunnel and you're just struck by the amazing wisdom of humans to be able to dig under the ground and you're filled with awe. I mean, aren't humans amazing that we have the wisdom to build such big tunnels? Just ask an engineer about all the wisdom and expertise that's involved in building something like that. It really is a marvel what we can do as humans. But our wisdom does more than just get you to the airport faster when driving east. Uh, What if you go out west? Well, in western Queensland, mining under the ground is actually a matter of life and death. You see, for my father-in-law and and many pastoralists like him, in the middle of the drought, they had to drill a bore kilometres under the earth so that they might get water, water they could bring up to save their stock. You see, wisdom, skill, understanding, it's a matter of life and death. Lots of lives were saved by drilling a bore like that. But what about us in the midst of suffering? It's in the midst of suffering that we really need wisdom. It's a matter of life and death. And you see, for Job, he's in the middle of a dark valley. For him, wisdom was a matter of life and death too. It's the same for us, isn't it? I mean, how many tragic stories have we heard of someone, tragedy befalls them, they're in the midst of suffering, and what do they do? They go out and make a bunch of unwise decisions. They turn to drink, they turn to drugs, they get in that car when they really shouldn't have and drive when they really shouldn't have. And in the midst of suffering, wisdom is a matter of life and death. And so we get the question in verse 11, verse 11, where can wisdom be found? Where does understanding dwell? Cast your eye over verses 13 to 32. We as humans, we're great at lots of things. We can find lots of things under the earth. Perhaps we can find wisdom. We'll have a look through those pages. Can we find wisdom? And the narrator, he kind of goes on a search here, doesn't he? I kind of demonstrated it in the kid's spot, didn't I, when I went on a search for wisdom. Well, the narrator goes from a search and he looks at the bottom of the sea. Hello, is there wisdom in the sea? No, sorry, the sea says. He goes to the marketplace. Wisdom, wisdom, anyone selling wisdom? And remember, he's desperate. He'll he'll sell his finest for a shortcut to wisdom. Goldies, rubies, you name it. Gold, rubies, silver. But no matter what, no wisdom. Ah. Uh, He's starting to get really desperate now, and the question's repeated in verse 20. Where does wisdom come from? Where does understanding dwell? And now he's asked everyone in the land of the living, in verse 21, he's so desperate that he'll even ask the dead in verse 22. But somewhat humorously, the dead answer something like this. They kind of shrug. Nah, sorry. Uh, We've heard a wisdom of, uh, we've heard a, a rumor of wisdom, but We don't know where it is. I mean, it's kind of comical, isn't it? To think of death saying something like that. After all, we've just heard a rumor of wisdom, they say. But you see the point that's getting at here? The point is that no one knows. And suffering proves that there's no end to the search of wisdom. And Job's friends certainly didn't know. You see, we're told a couple of important characteristics about Job's friends. We're told about where they're from. You see, Job's friends, they come from the three wisdom capitals of the ancient world. Uh, They sort of come from the Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford of that time, of the wisdom schools. What about your friends? Where do they go for wisdom? Where do they turn in the midst of their suffering? And are you tempted to follow them to the same places? The self-help books, the gurus, the Instagram influencers. Back when I lived in Sydney, um, a guy called Tony Robbins came out from the US and thousands of people came down to Olympic Park to hear him, one of the self-help guys. 
Maybe Tony Robbins can give the answers. Why do I have cancer? Why has this happened to me? But look, if he or anyone like him tells you they can give you all the answers, don't believe them. But that's just the non-Christians. What about the Christians? I want you to think about the wisest Christian person you know. Maybe it's a mentor, maybe a Christian counsellor. I think of our elders. And we think maybe, just maybe, if we could sit down with them, they could tell us, why is all this happening to us? But no, I'm sure our elders are too wise for that. They'll pray with you, they'll sit in silence with you, cry with you, but they won't be able to give you answers as to why exactly you are suffering like this. So that begs the question, why are we so often like Job's friends? Why are we so tricked to quick to try to answer people's suffering, to try and tell them what's wrong, to, you know, to fix their problem. We hear people say things like, look, this is all your fault because you, or the problem is you just don't have enough faith. If you had enough faith, then, you know, even modern medicine doesn't have all the answers. Sometimes people will have a mysterious condition and they'll have every test under the sun. They'll have been to every specialist imaginable and still no answers. Till finally someone, a doctor maybe, sits them down and says, you know, sometimes we don't find the answer. Sometimes we just have to manage the symptoms as best as we can. And you know what? That's a wonderful relief. It's a relief from the endless search for answers. You see, sometimes the restless search for answers can be worse than the suffering itself yes like job we wrestle with god we ask god why and god encourages from the scriptures particularly the psalms to be real with him but as christians we're free from the never-ending search for the answer why we can accept that we don't always get an answer we don't need to have an answer for everything because we know the god who has the answers to everything and what we really need is not the answers. What we need is God. We need God more than we need answers. Remember I asked, what about when someone we know is suffering and they come to us? Uh, we don't have to give them answers. We just care for them. I mean, we're not God. We can't answer all their questions. We just need to care for them, to cry with them, to pray with them to be with them. And as a church, we already do this, don't we? I know firsthand how many of you have cared for me and my family this year. Praise God for his work among us. Let's pray that God would make us into wise friends for those who suffer. Our second point, only God knows wisdom. And this leads to our second point. Now, I know it sounds a bit negative to say that no one but God knows wisdom, but it's the truth. You see, wisdom requires perspective. Let me give you an example of a new perspective. A while ago, I was visiting my dad, and we sat down with the iPad, and I showed him how Google Maps or Google Earth works, uh, and it really just blew his mind. I was explaining to him um, why Sydney is such a difficult town to get around for, ta for traffic. I was like, look here, Dad, see this big body of water here? That's the harbour, that makes it hard. See all these mountains over here? Yeah, that makes it hard. That's why Sydney takes such a long time to get around. And when I showed him this, I went on to show him his farm, I showed him his neighbour's property. He was very chuffed, he could see how many sheds his neighbour has. It blew his mind to have this new perspective, this bigger perspective on life. It's a perspective that he'd never seen before. You see, it's all important where your perspective is. You see, for God, he sees the full picture of things, the suffering in our life, where we are and where we're going. But for Job, their, his friends, their perspective was too small. For Job's friends, they were at ground level. All they could see was Job's suffering, and they thought, Job, you must have done something to deserve all this. And Job, well, his perspective was obscured by the very tears in his eyes. He couldn't see clearly. 
You see, for us as creatures, true wisdom, true perspective, the true answer to why, it's beyond us. Because it's important for us to remember, when it all boils down to it, there are only two kind of things. There's God, and there's the things God has made. And for us as creatures, we live on this side. We are things God has made. Only God is the creator, and we are the creations. And so only God has the ultimate perspective from beginning to end. You see, God doesn't have to go on a frantic search for wisdom throughout the world. No, no, no. We see in verse 24 that he see, sees all the world at once, from beginning to end. He sees all of it. And this is actually revolutionary news in the book of Job. You see, for one, this chapter is revolutionary because Job and his tiresome friends just stop, finally stop their poetic wisdom for a moment and we get some clarity. And their confusion about wisdom finally stops. And we hear for certain, no, no, only God knows wisdom. And in the midst of the chaos and confusion of what's going on for Job, God knows exactly what's going on. Uh, we experience this kind of chaos in our lives, don't we? I used to live in Darwin in the Northern Territory. Uh, and if you've ever been to Darwin in the wet season, you'll know about the thunderstorms. We had a pretty big thunderstorm last night, but it's nothing compared to um, Darwin in the Northern Territory. We used to sit up on the balcony of our apartment and watch the big thunderstorms roll in from the harbour. This chaotic mess of lightning and thunder. It was incredible to watch. And actually, sometimes these storms in Darwin, they turn into cyclones destructive cyclones whirling around and around and it can be quite fearsome but you know what this passage tells us there's someone who doesn't fear cyclones it's god god's not surprised by it we see in verse 25 and in verse 26 we see that god controls the storms or that god's like a master craftsman he's the one who tests wisdom god's the one who tests wisdom's work when wisdom goes to look for someone to check their answers against wisdom goes to god and so in the midst of our suffering, we have to remember that God is the creator and we are the creations. So let's take a moment in our busy lives now to stop and think about this. Stop and think about that for a moment. God is surprised by nothing. Nothing in your life surprises him. Can you just imagine how God sees the world? Imagine with me for a moment if you could see every moment of suffering that was going on in the world right now. Every cancer diagnosis, every divorce, every war, every ounce of suffering in the universe. I think if I was to experience all that, I would just shrivel up and die if I was to comprehend all of what goes on in just a single moment. But God does. But perhaps that's too large scale for us to imagine. Just think for a moment about every single tear that you have cried in your life. You know that God says in Psalm 56, verse 8, that God's kept every tear you've cried in a bottle. God knows every single moment of sadness that you have had in your life or you ever will have. Just stop and think about that for a moment. Every single tear. God knows. Now remember Job's friends. Job's friends, in their wisdom, they couldn't conceive that one innocent man could be suffering. They thought, if you suffered, you must have done something wrong. Yet God knows every innocent suffering that ever happens. You see, Job's friends and their wisdom, it was just too small. And you know why Job's friends' wisdom was so small? It's because their God was too small. You see, our God would go to the cross for us. Jesus, the most innocent sufferer, would suffer and die for us. What a strange wisdom jesus the innocent sufferer this kind of strange wisdom would have blown job's friends minds but that's the wisdom of god 
Brothers and sisters, is your God too small? Do you need to meet the God of the Bible, the God we meet in Job, the God who becomes like one of us and suffers like us on the cross? Even though Jesus was more innocent than Job, he suffered. He suffered so that we might be free from our sin, that we might be God's children. And this brings us to our final point. Wisdom is to fear God and turn from evil. So what do we do in the midst of suffering with a God who knows all? What do we do now? We've been on a quest for wisdom, haven't we? We've looked everywhere and we've seen that no one can know. And instead of finding answers to our suffering, we've found something much better. We've found an awesome God who knows all of it and loves us and became one of us. But the question is, practically, what do we actually do? We'll never figure out um, uh, how good and how loving God is until uh, we are wise in the midst of suffering. And God here, he tells us how to be wise in the midst of suffering. And what God tells us, it's joyously simple. It's simple. Read verse 28. Verse 28, have a look. He says to the human race, Fear the Lord, that is wisdom. Shun evil. To shun evil is understanding. You see, in the midst of our suffering, we can be in awe of our God. We're free from needing to know the meaning of why, and we can suffer knowing God and not needing to know all the answers. And in the midst of our suffering, we can even have a deeper relationship with God. You see, Job gets very dark in this book, in his poetic reflections, but Job never curses God. He never stops fearing God. But by the end of his speeches in chapter 31, he cries out to God, why? And God replies to him from a whirlwind, and the answer is again unexpected. God doesn't answer Job's questions with, well, this is what's going on. God says, the answer is, Job, I'm big. Trust me. God takes Job on a tour of all the world and how God rules it and made it, and and Job is gobsmacked by how great God is. And he says something interesting in chapter 42, verse 5. Job says, you know, I'd heard, wi- I'd heard rumors about, I'd heard about, I'd heard reports about you, God, but now in the midst of my sufferings, I've seen you. You see, that's what suffering does for us. It's easy for us to say, yeah, yeah, I know about God in the good times, but it's in the suffering that we so often see God and his goodness, and we see just how much we need him. C.S. Lewis once said that God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our consciences. But God shouts in our pains. Suffering is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And so when suffering strikes you, just hold on. Keep fearing God as best you can. That's wisdom. Keep meeting with other Christians, sharing with other Christians. Keep listening to God as much as you can in his word. Keep pouring your heart out to him in prayer. But also we're told not to make suffering an excuse for sin. Have a look at the second half of verse 28. To shun evil is understanding. I mean, how often in suffering do we find it easy to to justify stuff that we usually think is wrong? I mean, where does the world go in the midst of their suffering? Where do they flee to? Perhaps they flee into a bottle of wine, maybe into the arms of a stranger, or maybe just into the endless numbers of of mind-numbing entertainment that the world just delivers to us again and again and again through our screens. Something to just fill the kind of sad emptiness of suffering without God. All the while they curse God and his good intentions for us. But us, brothers and sisters, what about us? Don't run into the arms of sin 
No, when we suffer, run into the arms of a loving God. So I want to tell you, if you're suffering here today, hear this plea from your loving God. Don't run to sin, run to Him. Don't run to sin, run to Him. Don't run into the traps that sin will put before you in the midst of your suffering. Run to God. and Let us as your church family, let us help you. And as you do this, refuse, refuse to listen to the wisdom of the world. And as you do that, you'll look strange to them. You'll look strange to them as you suffer like Job did in his wise and worshipful suffering. Job perplexed his friends. They, they couldn't understand it. How could an innocent man suffer like that and, and not get angry at God, not turn on God? Well, friends, that's the kind of wisdom that defines our lives. We live by the wisdom of the cross, not the wisdom of the world. As Jesus said, it's in losing our lives that we find life. And as we suffer, we follow in the footsteps of our suffering Saviour, Jesus. And we become more like him. Let me pray for us. Loving Father, we're sorry for the times that we search for wisdom anywhere but you. We're so thankful that you know all things, that you are wise. And we thank you that you tell us how to be wise, and it's so gloriously simple. Help us to fear you and love you now. God, this can be a hard word for us to hear, that we are just fragile creatures and you are God, but humble our hearts, we pray.